Well, good afternoon. I'm Tim Reeves, the Deputy Director of the Eisenhower Presidential Library and Museum. Thank you uh, for attending another one of our brown bag luncheons. Um, this is becoming a very uh, successful program. We hope to do more of them in the future. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Professor Ivan Kurilla of Volgograd State University in Russia. He specializes in 19th and 20th century American history in Russian, and particularly Russian-American relations. But today he's here to discuss the memorialization of the Battle of Stalingrad and the use of the battle in contemporary American politics. And this is appropriate uh, for us for several reasons. As most of you probably know, that we're just beginning a series of exhibits entitled World War II Remembered, which will commemorate uh, various 70th anniversaries of the Second World War. The 70th anniversary of the Battle of Stalingrad uh, took place uh, in February, it was the anniversary of the, the finish of that um, battle. And let's face it, um, most Americans don't know much about the Battle of Stalingrad or a lot about the the Eastern Front, we tend to look at battles like the Battle of Midway or the, the Battle of, of uh, Britain, um, but those battles in the Eastern Front, in terms of the overall outcome of the war, were perhaps even more important. And it's also appropriate because uh, Professor Kurilla is a native of Volgograd, um, which used to be called Stalingrad. So he brings a unique perspective to his remarks today. And before I bring him up here, I want to thank Professor Norman Saul from the University of Kansas uh, for making this program possible and bringing our visitor today. And we will have time uh, for questions after he makes his remarks, and we'll have you come up to the microphone because we are filming today's um, program, so we do want to make sure we get everybody recorded. So, Yvonne? Thank you very much, and uh, let me also start with a thanks to uh, Abilene Eisenhower Library and uh, to Professor Sol, who uh, actually organized my visit here. And uh, I, I would uh, start with, um, again, with a reminder that Stalingrad battle, which uh, finished at, uh, a little bit more than 70 years ago, was probably the the biggest uh, battle of the world history. It was the biggest battle and the biggest war that uh, mankind remember. And uh, it was a turning point in the event on the Eastern Front of that war, uh, and probably the turning point on the whole of the Second World War. And at that point, at that time in 1943, uh, leaders of uh, allies, leaders of uh, the United States of America, President Roosevelt and uh, Prime Minister Mr. Churchill of uh, Great Britain uh, recognized the importance of that battle. Uh, of that battle, and uh, we had a lot of uh, well, documents and uh, recognition of of that importance. Uh, unfortunately, uh, during the Cold War, probably in the Western uh, schools or Western public opinion, the Stalingrad battle shaded away for a while. But uh, that was a well understandable one on the one hand, but uh, it also uh, well, uh, probably was not quite just toward the uh, great sacrifice that uh, the Russian people, the Soviet people at that time, of course, made during that uh, great effort to, to stop the Nazi invasion. Uh, uh, but uh, I must also confess that the Stalingrad battle, battle itself is not uh, exact my field of study. My field of study more of U.S. Russian, US -Russian relations and also the uh, current use of history and how the uh, past, the history is uh, uh, well, integrated in the contemporary public discussions in Russia. And that is why, and what is, that is where the Stalingrad battle takes a huge uh, role, play, par, uh, plays a huge role. Uh, you know that Russia, Russians uh, are very historiocentric nation, and we uh, always socialize uh, around the great pages of our history. And the pages of uh, and the uh, Second World War as, as a whole uh, was the greatest example of sacrifice and also the greatest victory that uh, Soviet people uh, ever uh, remember and ever 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 took. And uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it was not a many 
play, many pages of, of Russian history that we can be proud of. Or, I mean, that generations who are still alive can be proud of. But the Second World War was a very important point of, uh, of, of our proud, and it still is still a very, very important point of, of, of our proud. That is why uh, the memory of the Second World War is very, uh, well, is, is something that unites all, uh, all of the Russians. You can uh, argue about many uh, pages of our history, like there is a, still uh, quite an argument about the uh, like October Revolution of 1917 when Bolsheviks came to power. There are still some argument about Stalin's role event, but there is uh, which virtually no argument about the significance and the sacrifice of, this, uh, of the Second World War, which in Russia is usually referred as a uh, great patriotic war of, of Russian people. And a Stalingrad battle is a uh, turning point of that war, the greatest uh, well, moment and uh, probably one of the biggest uh, also uh, sacrifices if you count the victims. It was over a million of people died on the streets of Stalingrad just uh, for half an, uh, half an year that it took place. It actually started in July of 1942 when Germans approached uh, the city and it was a uh, very uh, bloody battle uh, on the streets of the uh, city in the fall of 1942. And then uh, in November of 1942, the uh, Soviet forces began the encirclement of Germans and uh, it all ended by early February. February 2nd was the last part of German, uh, uh, German forces surrounded in the city. Mm, surrender it. And so uh, during this uh, half a year, uh, more than a million people died. Now we have uh, the whole uh, well, number of people, population of the city is about the same, about one million. So we have, we have just uh, in one short period of history, we have more dead there people than ever lived uh, simultaneously in the city. And this is a, uh, something which we cannot forget. It's, uh, well, I, I grew out there, I grew up in, in the city. And uh, I felt, uh, you know, some of my friends who came to the city later, who came to Volgograd being already adult, grow up, grown ups, uh, they uh, told me that, you know, sometimes I feel like, like I'm living in a huge cemetery. I did not feel uh, felt like that because I, I grew up there. It was normal for me. But I remember that oh, I, when I was a child on the grand playgrounds in the center of the city, when you uh, dig deep enough uh, well, on some on some uh, playground, you will see not the uh, soil uh, but the red bricks, the remains of the old city, because all the city was destroyed during the battle, and it was built in you on these uh, grounds. And I remember that when any of the mm, new construction projects uh, were uh, started in, in, uh, in the city, uh, at least even now, and especially when I was a child still in the 70s, uh, every uh, construction uh, stopped at some point when they, some unexploded bomb was uh, founded there or when the remains of the, some soldier at buried or unfounded uh, in 1943 is, is founded. So it was always a part of our time, of, our, of, our, uh, of my childhood. I remember when, when I was born uh, long after the war was over, more than 20 years after the end of the war. So uh, this is a part of our life. And this is very important not only for the people who live in Volgograd, but also for all Russians because uh, this is something that uh, we all, uh, that uh, something that makes our the one kind, one nation, one uh, people, and uh, there is a big, uh, many, many, many monuments and many memorials, and we have a huge memorial to the mo motherland on the uh, on the top uh, hill in the um, on a, near near the center of the city, where. Uh, part of the battle took place. Uh, but uh, I would say how this uh, memory evolved uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, back in the 1990, uh, 1991, when the uh, Soviet Union collapsed and the, all of the communist ideology collapsed, for a while, for a very brief, uh, brief period of time, it looks like the uh, Second World War was a part of this big Soviet myth and it will be destroyed simultaneously with everything else, with uh, uh, Russian attitude towards the October Revolution, which destroyed, of course. 
but it, 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 it did not work like that because uh, the Second World War was a family memory for almost for all the R Russian people. Some of them, many of us, uh, uh, have uh, somebody who died, who were killed during the uh, during the war, and uh, much and uh, others had somebody who fought on the fr on the front line. So it was a uh, family f uh, memory. It's not just a propaganda myth or something which is introduced by the state, and it's still there. And uh, back in the, 19, uh, in the 90s, in the decade of the 90s, when it was a huge reform and it was very uh, hard economic reform for Russians, uh, Yeltsin government, that time president of Russian Federation, Yeltsin, uh, probably did not pay enough attention to these uh, national memories or to symbolic uh, importance of the, of the symbolic landscape of the country. And by the end of that decade, there was a big demand for restoration of some kind of, uh, of uh, common, uh, common memory, of common uh, interpretation of, of uh, at least some por portion of the national memory. And that was uh, actually uh, understood by the next president, by uh, Vladimir Putin. He used this uh, demand very skillfully, I would say. Uh, president Putin was appointed acting president uh, on the New Year Eve of year 2000. And already in the February of uh, 2000, he visited Volgograd. He visited Volgograd, he visited Mamayev Hill, this uh, place of the uh, big memorial. And he addressed actually Russian people with this vantage point. With vantage point. And he then kept it, uh, well, he, he continued visiting Volgograd at least once in every two years. He was there during the uh, celebration of the 60th anniversary of the gr uh, Great Battle. He was there this February when it was 70th anniversary. And he was there several times in between each time visiting these uh, memorial sites, each time addressing the patriotism and ad addressing the question, uh, problems of uh, patriotic education or uh, addressing veterans, meeting veterans of the Second World War. So uh, Putin managed to link his personality with this uh, uh, memory of, of great battle. And it worked, I would say. It worked uh, despite, well, my personal attitude toward President Putin is rather critical, but I can uh, admit, I should admit that he made it uh, very, very skillful and that, and he understood this demand. He, uh, he answered this uh, huge demand for, for a common memory. Uh, and, uh, well, he, uh, uh, there was one uh, year when uh, President Putin didn't visit uh, Volgograd. It was uh, 2008. It was a year of the election of, well, of President Medvedev. But uh, Putin probably sent Medvedev to Volgograd. Medvedev was in Volgograd in February 2008, just one month before his election to presidency. So it was a deliberate uh, use of this symbol, uh, deliberate use it for a... Uh, well, for the government, or for, for this regime, we'll say, we can say, uh, uh, sake. And uh, uh, after the uh, Second World War, during the f first decades of the Second World War, when still the veterans' generation was in power in uh, all the European countries, and uh, actually in the world of the world, uh, Volgograd became, or it was Stalingrad before, I would probably should, should mention, it was, uh, the first uh, name of the city was Tsaritsa, and it was renamed Stalingrad in 1925, and uh, it was in Stalingrad during the Second World War. It was renamed to Volgograd in 1961 during Nikita Khrushchev's destalinization campaign. And uh, uh, during that time, Stalingrad and then Volgograd was visited by almost all, uh, leaders of almost all uh, countries, uh, of well, allied countries. It was visited by General de Gaulle, President, uh, French President General de Gaulle. It was visited by uh, all, actually all French presidents, uh, well, uh, from de Gaulle to Mitterrand. And it was visited by many world leaders. Uh, unfortunately, it was never visited by American president. I would say I always try to convince my friends who I don't know if they have access to, to presidents, American presidents, but to some State Department officials, that uh, it would uh, play a great uh, 
you know, if, if ever American president will visit Volgograd and address Russian people from Mamayev Hill, it will uh, have a huge impact of, on, on Russians. Because one of the uh, ideas that Russians uh, have toward, well, about America is that Americans are, are uh, do underestimate the sacrifice that Russian did during the Second World War. It's something that uh, Russian feels that, well, Americans do not know about uh, this, well, uh, number of dead that Russia suffered. I just remind you that uh, Soviet, the whole Soviet Union before the war was uh, about 170 million uh, uh, men of population, and 27 million died during the war. So it was a huge sacrifice, and it's still felt very much in every Russian family. And this is a, I cannot compare uh, to anything in American history. Maybe civil war was uh, the same uh, impact to, to American uh, uh, well, feeling, American generation generations, but, well, it was already 150 years since the civil war in America, and it was, and we still have a veterans of the Second World War in Russia. And, well, uh, so quite recently, maybe generation, after generation change, maybe less people visit, are visiting uh, our city, but in the internal politics, it's continued to be very important point of uh, of uh, socialization of the uh, of the country, of course, uh, our regional uh, politicians try to play on that, and it was a, uh, several attempts to. It was from se from several point of view, different points of view. Uh, our previous governor two years ago tried to uh, invite more federal money, of course, uh, for the Stalingrad. Uh, for idea of Stalingrad patriotic upbringing, he uh, tried to create this all, nation, all national center of patriotic upbringing in Volgograd and to get huge money from the federal budget. It didn't work, but it, it also played on another side. Uh, there are, from time to time, uh, some political forces in Russia wanted to rename city back to Stalingrad. And the line of argumentation is that uh, the, wor the whole world knows this uh, city as Stalingrad. It was a place of the great battle, so we need to get back to the name of Stalingrad. And there are also, of course, people who don't want to get back to that name because it involves the Stalin's name. And well, I think that vast majority of Russian and uh, I don't I I, and, uh, I know that uh, vast majority of uh, citizens of Volgograd do not want to live in the city which bear, bears the name of of Stalin. But uh, from time to time, politicians uh, start to to discuss this idea, usually for for purely political reasons. It was recently uh, those of you who may be uh, follow Russian uh, news uh, during the celebration of the 70th anniversary of Stalingrad battle in February. Uh, uh, Volgograd City Duma, City Municipal Council, uh, again started that idea and they wanted to call City Volgograd not, uh, not permanently but just uh, six days every year for all the military uh, uh, or victory uh, holidays and also for the Day of Remembrance. So, well, uh, it was a strange decision, but most of, uh, I was probably, uh, probably that was a, not, a, not a real uh, idea uh, that based on the, some historical conscience, but it was a purely uh, political uh, attempt to divert the public attention from the uh, bad reputation of the current council. But it was, uh, again, discussed very much and discussed very widely. Uh, there was another problem for the citizen of, of, of Volgograd. Uh, as I grew, out, uh, grew up and well, grew, when uh, my generation and of course people who are younger and, and, and elder than me, uh, for a long time the city was uh, a city of one event. And for the citizen of Volgograd it was very interesting to discover that uh, the city had actually the more than 400 years of, his, of history. And there was a lot of, uh, well, not, not great battles, but there are many other interesting or important uh, events took place in the city during the 19th century, 18th century, and well before. And that is an uh, internal attempt to make the uh, image of the history more diverse, more uh, 
but uh, if you come, if you ever come to Volgograd, and I invite everybody of you, uh, you will see that it's still uh, the most of the monuments in the city, and the most of the museums of the city are devoted to only the Great Patriotic War. It's uh, still considered to be the kind of capital city of uh, of the of the war memory of the Second World War memory of the uh, this. Uh, war patriotic upbringing. Uh, but uh, I should mention by the end that there is also uh, mm, there is also other, other pages of our history. And it, some of them are connected to the history, again with the Germany, but it's a very different kind of Germany. In 18th century, in uh, 1760s, uh, well, just south of that time, Tsaritsyn, now it's uh, within the uh, Volgograd uh, city limits, uh, one German colony was founded. It was Germans uh, from southern Germany who founded the colony Sarepta, and uh, that colony uh, brought a piece of, little piece of European city culture to this uh, South Russian steppes. Step, steps. And... Uh, it was an interesting, and we have now a museum there, and it is a different kind of Europe that can, came to Volgograd, very different compared to what we had in 1942. It was another, another Germans uh, who brought that civilization, who brought a, uh, well, a culture, many, many uh, cultural feasts and, and uh, many inventions uh, to, this, uh, to this part of Russia, to the southern part of Russia. And, uh, well, I think that to remember these both examples is very important for us. And this is very important uh, for Russia as a whole, that the Second World War, which uh, continued to be, and I, I think that will continue to be the central part, the focal part of the uh, Russian history, uh, still needs uh, this other remembrance and the other uh, uh, well, examples of, of, of different uh, interactions with Euro Europeans. Uh, uh, I would be happy. I will be happy to answer your questions. And probably I will develop some of, of part of my presentation, answering your your interest. Because uh, and thank you for the attention by this time. Uh, I uh, yeah. If you want to, to ask questions, please come to the microphone because it's all uh, it's written there. Yeah, if you can, if you can introduce yourself, just for a, yeah. yes. My name is Steve Smith. I drove up from Wichita, Kansas, for this, and thank you very much for your presentation. And you're right, as Americans, I don't think we do appreciate the sacrifices made there, and I wanted to learn more about that. Uh, before my question, one comment: you mentioned the Volga Germans. Possibly, professors told you we have a lot of Volga Germans in uh, yeah. West Kansas, Northwest Kansas. That's a very big part of our heritage. But my question, you mentioned that there were a million people died in the streets of, uh, of uh, Volgograd, mm. Stalingrad. Was that just the Russians? How many Germans were killed in that? Yeah. Uh, there is a not, uh, there is a uh, important question, but I have no, uh, I should confess I have no answer. Okay. because And I don't think that anybody has a direct answer. Because these numbers are, well, uh, it's just estimates in many re uh, reasons. Uh, the place where my university, Volgograd State University, stay, is situated now, uh, it was uh, one of the very uh, one of the sites of the very harsh uh, b uh, battle uh, battles during the Stalingrad battle, and there was uh, eight regiments uh, created from the young uh, military cadets. Actually, it was eight military schools situated nearby, and during the battle, when every resources were needed, and they just were sent to defend to defend some dangerous di uh, direction, and out of that eight uh, cadet schools, uh, only one was formed after they. So, uh, like uh, seven of the uh, well, seven of uh, any, uh, every eight. Uh, Cadets died at that, that place, and you know there no, there was no uh, exact list of those people. We uh, many of the uh, people who died there remained un, unlist or un, un, uncounted or unnoticed. Uh, I mean, in, in to many extent, it's uh, to, to 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 large extent, it's just estimates. Uh, 
uh, unfortunately, there is no, not all of the regiments that were sent there in the very the hard, had had the full list, or some of the documents were perished during the same battle. Some of the staff documents were uh, buried by or uh, destroyed by bombing or by something. So there is uh, no, not exactly this thing. Uh, the, la the latest estimate, I cannot uh, say it is 100% uh, exact, but uh, some estimate was about a million and a half from both sides. Uh, but, and it's, um, well, you can add many more uh, who died from once and we were get to another statistics with uh, who you know, survived the battle maybe for a couple of months and then died out of of, of once or of uh, well they were frozen because it was a very severe winter that time of that year and that's thank you yeah. yeah any other question yeah please come here My name is Matt Thompson and I actually work across the street at the museum and I also appreciate you coming to speak to us. Um, one thing I was hoping maybe you could talk about was that in many of the accounts I've read uh, on the Russian side they talk about how the military leaders often had to resort to fairly brutal tactics in order mm -hmm. to enforce discipline and use violence against their own troops. Is, does that manifest itself in any of the contemporary collective memory and discourse when people mm -hmm. think about this battle? Yeah, you probably refer to very uh, f famous uh, order number 2027, uh, which was one, no, no one step back, and it included actually the very severe punishment, well, just uh, immediate execution for everybody who uh, getting back. It was uh, taken in July, just in the beginning of the Stalingrad battle, and it was, a, and this uh, order now even in the school textbooks, people know that that was, but there was no. Uh, unified opinion about that. It's a still a matter of discussion. Some of the people say that's no other, uh, well, no other um, way to stop the retreat could be taken. And it was a, but it was a uh, very really se severe uh, measures made in Ju July in 1942. It was a time, yeah. But uh, there was, uh, of course, there are two sides. Another side that said it was too cruel. It was too and inhuman, but in the midst of such a battle, it's, uh, it's hard. To, uh, from our position today, it's hard to uh, well, evaluate, to judge. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very cautious to judge uh, the cruelty of that period of time. It's, uh, it was cruel by, them, by itself without, without, you know, cr cruelty, without counting the cruelty of officers or regime. Yeah, yeah please. My name is Stefan Megri, and I'm actually from Germany, so I'm a little bit more familiar with this topic, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to ask if you see a difference how the Russians mem um, commemorate the battle between the Cold War and the time after the Cold War. So you mentioned how, how Putin kind of instrumentalized mm -hmm. the battle. Is it still the same, or is it a little bit more, I would call it, neutral and more academical? The how they how they how they see it how they do research about it or is it still the kind of instrumentalization against of course the old enemy Germany Germany okay thank you uh, I cannot say it's uh, to any extent it's uh, instru uh, instrumentalized against old enemy Germany uh, I would say that Germany now looks more friendly uh, even from I, I think from Putin's point of view, Germany is much more friendly to Russia than the United States. It's a, he, he used to work in Germany. He knows Germans. He speaks German. So it's a, uh, and it, it, I do not, uh, I cannot say that it was instrumental, instrumentalized that way even uh, in the Soviet period. Well, but there is a big, uh, there is a difference between Soviet time and nowadays. And the difference not in the, uh, well, this is a generational probably difference. That time we still had a lot of veterans and the major agenda was determined by veterans, by those people who remember, who, for whom this uh, battle of the Second World War was a personal perception, not just a something that they read in, in books. But today it's a different story. We, well, the veterans are less and uh, less, and less veterans are active and uh, of course they are senior people and uh, more and more, well, now the agenda is determined by the people who were born after the Second World War. And some of them were even could not re, could, cannot remember even the Soviet Union. And, 
uh, that is a different uh, story and if you and, and this is a different because uh, for those people who do not remember who do not have their own uh, perception this is it's easier to instrumentalize it's easier to take some part of this history to use it for political sake it's hard to do with something that everybody remember it's easier if you read about that or even heard about that from your older relatives and that's why I think this regime is much more openly instrumentalized and used it than it, it was possible during Brezhnev era. Of course, Brezhnev himself, a general secretary for a long time, a leader of the Soviet Union, Brezhnev was himself a veteran. So for him, it also was a part of not Stalingrad battle. He, he wasn't there, but uh, he was a veteran of the war. So for him, his, uh, the war was a personal perception, personal memory. But for Putin, no. And for Putin, it was easy to... To use it uh, and to um, and he very openly used it. I didn't mention uh, just a uh, year and a half ago before the new cycle of elections, before the well, Duma elections, presidential elections, Putin came to Volgograd. It was in early May, near the Victory Day, and he announced their uh, creation of so-called Popular Front in support of himself, actually, support of, and uh, he, well, he, he did it in Volgograd. And he uh, told, said, well, there was another discussion unrelated to this topic, but about the World Soccer Cup, which will take, in, take place in Russia in, 19, uh, in 2018. And, and Volgograd was considered one of the host, to be one of the host city, but it, it hasn't been decided by that time. So somebody, so somebody asked Putin, uh, will Volgograd get into the least final list of the cities where the World Cup, Soccer Cup will, take, uh, will be uh, held? And Putin answered, uh, how can you win without Stalingrad? And that was very important for, yeah, uh, it was, I think this is very important for Putin himself. Putin understand the importance of Stalingrad for, for current uh, political, uh, well, any, for, for, uh, he used Stalingrad for any political uh, purpose. And he used it and he, uh, well, somebody even made the T-shirt with this quotation, how can you win without Stalingrad? And it's a, uh, it was a story how it used now. It's a different one. But I would say this all instrumentalized for internal, for home politics, not for foreign politics. It's, it's about uh, keeping, well, keeping the society uh, more uh, homogeneous, I would say, at least in this Second World War. But what is, again, important, uh, it's a different attitude toward history. In the Soviet Union, in the time of the Soviet Union, we had very much unified and controlled history of the whole uh, well, any history it was a very ideologically driven, driven uh, subject or field. Uh, now we have a different story. We have a lot of opinions, and the historians write from very uh, multiple different points of view. But uh, the only period of history is still attempted to be controlled by the state. And this is the history of the Second World War, because probably the regime understands this is based on this particular interpretation of the, of the war. And that's why the uh, regime wants to control. It cannot do it the same way it, it was in the Soviet Union. It, we have a lot of publications, academic publications, but uh, the go uh, government wants to control the textbooks, wants to control the memorials, wants to control how the uh, Second World War is portrayed in the journalism and political speeches and all of this stuff. This is the only focal point where the state is still interfering into history, which is also uh, says for how it's, how important uh, uh, this uh, interpretation of this this period for the uh, for the current regime's uh, well, symbolic universe. Thank you. Another question. Any more question? No? I think. I think that's it, and thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. Just, just want to thank you for coming out once again for sharing your stories with us. So. Thank you. Good thank afternoon. You.